One of the things we love to do is include our alumni. And we have a very special guest today from an alumni standpoint because he's not only a rock star alumni, he's a rock star entrepreneur, and he's a rock star tennis player. How many tennis players do we have in the house? Good, just two. That's great. <laughs> I'm more of a racquetball guy myself. <laughs> so the Office of the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning is run by Michael Denon. How many people do not know Michael Denon yet? Okay, good. We're doing our job. One of the things, he's always on the front line. He's, he's really adopted social media as part of his overall strategy, and he wants to help create awareness for other departments. And so what we decided to do today was bring uh, an alumni who created a video platform that puts YouTube into a shameful corner in the higher education <coughs> field. And we'll get more into the specifics, but what's exciting about this opportunity today is learning a new platform from an insider to be able to help run video contests. And so we're going to talk about really why video and why now. We're going to talk about the actual indie platform and then actually do some demonstrations to see how you can create these challenges. <laughs> so here's the clarification. Um, UCI Media and OVPTO, we handle support for those under the Division of Undergraduate Education and in the OVPTO uh, family. But if you are interested in video production, we've got a full green screen studio and things like that. Uh, it is okay to follow us and everyone else here online. And video resources we talked about. We've got a lot of training videos. So let's, let's go to here. When I asked for, during the RSVP forum about where everybody is, I always like to get a feel of where everybody is. And so if we're looking at what your knowledge is of the indie platform, everybody has no idea. And nobody has any idea. So we're all here together. And then I love how mathematics comes out as a bell curve. It's just so fun to see that in action, right? When you think that your stats teacher is lying to you all these years, but they're not. This is almost a perfect bell curve when it comes to using video as a component of your marketing. So we have classically a few people on either of the ends. Are you going to come in a second? Oh, that's fine. This is for the sake of your coolness. Uh, but we really have this bell curve. So people right in the middle. Not sure if they're really good at it or not sure if they're really bad at it. And our goal is to move everybody over to the number fives here today. So a couple top level challenges with video, some people also fell out with the RSVP and I want to see if this resonates, is that video seem to date so quickly and it seems like big projects to constantly have to update. How many people feel that's a problem with video? A lot of work and then all of a sudden you got to redo it. We're going to talk about embracing the value of user generated content to solve that problem. Then developing purposeful concepts for the use of video, creating something that doesn't look, sound crummy and unprofessional. How many people have that problem? Okay, liars. <laughs> the, the solution is understanding the fundamentals plus the right equipment plus the right software to get the good video. So it's a lot easier than you might think. You just have to know what it is that you're missing uh, to sort of reduce that barrier. And then today's sponsors are Indie.com, they're the people who bought the food, and so you should be appreciative of that, and they're bringing this amazing platform. So with that, I'm going to bring up uh, Mr. Neil, and Neil Grover is an alum, a tennis star, and a good guy overall. Give him a round of applause. Thank you, Ryan. All right, so you've got your team slide up there first if you want to start. The big button is moving forward, and the lower button moves First, back. I want to know how many people on, on the Indie team answered they didn't know what we did. So. <laughs> Um, so yeah, real quick, thanks everyone for having me, appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> I am a UCI alum. I'm on the CEO roundtable, have been for the last about 10 years with the chancellor, uh, or chancellors. Um, I'm on the Alumni Association board as well and a couple other advisory boards. Um, I was a tennis major, um, minored in econ and poli sci. <laughs> and um, um, let's see, I've been, Greg uh, is one of my co-founders and these other great uh, folks are part of our team. Um, we're housed over in the Cove, Applied Innovation. I'm on the board over there as well. And um, let's see, we've been in e-commerce. Before we started the company, the reason why we started the company, just to give you a little bit of background, um, Greg and myself and Melissa and Kristen and Andrew joined us after, but we'd all been in e-commerce for 15 plus years, sold over $5 billion of products online competing with Amazon. Uh, we ran a company called Buy.com that um, you know, we had a great team. We went from losing $100 million a year to 13 consecutive profitable quarters, sold that, um, and, uh, and ran a couple other companies, a company called Bluefly and a company called Rakuten, and we started Indy. And the real reason we started Indy and, and everything we're doing now, which we're going to show you, is about getting your customer, whoever that is, in this, in this case it's your students, your fellow faculty, um, the community, 
to really engage with you and learn more about what you're doing and now really share and spread the word about what you're doing. So, um, you know, did I do that right? Is this all right, good. You did that right. All right, good. I, I, These uh, are three main topics that we're talking about. Right, why great. video, why now, using the platform, and then a quick start for video contests. And if you guys have any questions during this, feel free to interrupt, uh, ask questions. Um, why video, why now? So I'm not sure how much um, all of you are familiar with what's going on in social media with regards to your reach and the algorithms. I'm sure some of you are pretty upset that your own personal reach has gotten limited or changed. Well, if you're a brand, it is basically dead. And so um, we'll take a brand like Starbucks, 36 million followers on Facebook. If they post something on Facebook today, or last year, 36 million people would see that in their feed. Today, if they post that, roughly less than a half a percent sees that. And on Instagram, it's about 1%. And you may say, well, why? And it's because Facebook slash Instagram slash Twitter slash everyone is limiting your reach if you're a brand. And why are they doing that? Well, they want to charge more for ads. And so at the same time that your organic reach, meaning that free reach, hi, the test will be in a few minutes, so please be ready. Um, <laughs> the same time that your organic reach goes down, um, they are charging more for, for brands to pay. Now, as an individual, you don't care that much to see, have everyone see what you were wearing yesterday, other than Andrew. Um, but, but for a brand, you really do. And so brands are paying a lot more money. Ad prices have skyrocketed the last two quarters um, you know, for Facebook and Instagram. And that's because they've gotten rid of this reach. So today, the current network effect is if a brand, and think of the brand as UC Irvine or any of your departments, post something in social media, if you have 500 followers, 5,000 followers, 50,000 followers, whatever it may be, whereas before you were speaking to all of them, now you're speaking to about one out of 100 of them. And so your voice has gotten much, much, much smaller. What our platform does, and if you can enable and empower your students, your fellow faculty, and the community, in this case, to create content and interact with you, and they post content and interact with it, all of their network sees that. So at the same time the networks have lowered a brand's reach, they've elevated an individual person's reach. So you really want to give the power to the people here to get your word out. So something else that we deal with a lot, um, we deal with it with the brands is, um, and this is kind of what's happened now in social media, is, uh, you know, there's a lot of fake numbers out there as well. And so um, people may not have as big of followings as they say, and you see a lot of ad agencies now kind of go with, well, how do we deal with this? So how do we work with fake influencers, with fake followers and fake engagement in a more authentic way? Well, that's one of the great things about video as well is it can get across your point um, in a much more authentic way that gets across to your end consumer, you know, to really understand what you're doing. Well, then you sit there and go, okay, well, videos, I'm starting to understand how video can be beneficial, but why don't we just use YouTube? Um, YouTube has some of the similar limitations. One, they've, they've limited um, the algorithms dramatically or changed the algorithms dramatically. Um, but one of our biggest things from what we do and what YouTube does is YouTube's the greatest place to go watch content. It's a one-way communication. You put content up, someone can watch it. Maybe they can comment on it. Maybe they can put a thumbs down or, or troll you and put something negative. Our platform's all about two-way interaction. So you ask your students, faculty, community to upload content in response to something that you've asked for. You cannot do that on YouTube. You cannot physically upload a content to someone else's channel. Um, and so then on top of that, you get full control. You can control what content gets approved. There's no advertising. And then we want this content to get out into social media. And so our platform, again, incentivizes that, those users to share their content, which drives that network effect, which again, doesn't happen on YouTube as well. So some of the opportunities that we believe exist here within the university um, and with the different departments is, you know, today again, anything you do on social media, you're really renting that following. Um, you don't get email addresses for the folks, you don't own the content that gets uploaded, and you don't get any of the data on what's happening. Um, <clears throat> for anybody that's engaging with you uh, on social media, that's something that we do very differently. We give you all of that. It's, if it, it's as if it's your own video channel, video platform. As I mentioned, you reach less than 1% of your followers on social media without the help of your students, alumni, faculty, and community. Um, at the same time, ad prices are going up. I, I don't think many of you are spending a lot of money on social media um, to perpetuate or to promote what you're doing, but the prices are, as I said, going quite up. And you want to maximize your, your relationships with your students, your alumni, your faculty, and your community. And this is a great way to get that engagement going. And lastly, 
for the, as, as Ryan kind of mentioned, it's hard to get videos. It's great to get UGC. It's hard to get UGC because you, and that's user generated content because it's hard for people to send that to you. They've got to send you a Dropbox link. They've got to email it to you. You've got to download it, um, whether it's videos or photos. Um, and it's even more difficult to display that content. So our platform, again, you can download every video or photo that's been uploaded to you. We can also embed it into your site, um, and we can talk a little bit about that. Um, so you can get a real good um, experience with this content showcasing what you guys are doing. You can also make everything private. So if you want to ask your students or the community to give you feedback on something, it can all be private and just give you feedback um, for yourself um, through a video uh, method. So what are we powering? We power digital engagement, um, you know, so it can be embedded into the university site or into different department sites, or it can live at indie.com forward slash UCI alumni, as an example. UCI alumni has a channel. I'm on the board, coincidental. Um, and then, um, but also, it, again, it, 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 it's tied to your constituents, whether it's your students, your faculty, your, um, your community, as they share that content out into social media to drive more awareness around what you're doing, all leading people back to the great things going on at UCI. A couple examples, as I mentioned, of, of where we're embedded in. We're launching with the Wynn Hotels. You'll see embedded content if you're looking at a room, a dining experience. Um, this is the largest detailer in Indonesia. They just raised a billion dollars from Alibaba. They're embedding us, they're tying us into all their customers. We actually do a lot of other things that don't apply to, car, um, to, to universities, but we basically power commerce. So if you post a photo or video of what you're wearing, you can make money off of every single thing to one of 1,500 retailers. Separate discussion, separate time. Um, but. Um, the challenges that we face with video, um, is this still me? Right. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, you know, you've tried to get students to create content, but one of the biggest things is, is putting out an incentive. And it could be something small like the one that gets the most engagement or the video that we like the most, we're gonna highlight. We're gonna put it on our site, we're gonna send it out to our alumni group or put it on our, in our newsletter. It doesn't have to be a big incentive, but something that still gives people a, uh, an award for either making the best content or sharing the content, depending on what your ultimate goal is. Second thing is making it a low bar. If you put out there that you've got to create this great piece of content, people will get scared. They'll think you need to hire a, a videographer, you got to do very um, high-end editing. You've got your best camera and best um, you know, ability right here. These things are amazing and got, they can create great content and they're really easy to edit off of. Um, and so you really want to just make it super easy super low uh, hurdles to get people to get content up, and then the ability to track how well it's all going. And again, our platform really does that. We'll touch on that um, here in a couple slides. So really, do you, do, does everyone here want to create more exposure for all the great stuff that you're doing? Hopefully that's a yes. Good. Let's get a affirmative. Does everybody want to get the good stuff they're doing out there in the world? Yes. All right, okay. good. And, and do you know what you're to do with the videos that you make right now? No, so I mean, that's, that's okay, it's good. And so that's why we're doing this. And um, can you, is there something behind there? Okay, so again, it's really about driving authentic content. Um, and we'll show you different examples, but there's so many great things going on. And um, you know, here, here at school, and I learn about them all the time from the different, um, you know, different panels or, or boards of things I'm on. But getting that out to the community and letting the community know what's going on, engaging the alumni so they can see how all the great things are going, you know, whether it's getting more donors, getting more fans for what you're doing, involving the community, all really, really important. And it's great to come from the faculty. It's great when Professor or Dean or Provost Denon, all of the above, wants to do those. But it's even better when the students can say, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm creating, this is what I want to be, and gets that out there. Um, and so, um, you know, the other thing is, it's really important for students to get themselves in front of videos. In every position, every job going forward, they're gonna need to sell themselves. And, you know, I've had some meetings years ago with different departments at the university that said, oh gosh, we would never want our students to be in front of a video. Um, you know, they can't do that. We'd have to, like, prep them forever. Well, you know what, when they graduate, they're gonna have to be able to do that, whether it's in front of a video or, or be talking to, their employers, prospective employers, coworkers, and so it's better that they get trained now and that's part of their curriculum and part of what they're doing than later on not know how to do this at all. And with that, I'll hand that over to, uh, to Andrew. Andrew is employee zero. Real quick, any questions on video? <clears throat> 
or why Indy or why we did it or anything of the above? Nope. Yep. Nope. So, you know, what's the, the biggest kind of need that you've identified when you speak to the different units and the different university stakeholders you've had conversations with? You know, everyone wants something different, and that's the great thing about what our platform allows for. Um, and so some folks, like Illuminations was the first one to use our, our, um, our platform. They wanted to highlight the great things going on in the arts within the school um, outside of the art department. So other students that were in, in, interested in, in uh, art type of pr uh, programs to let the students in the school know about that. And you know, good, good example. Our very first challenge we did was with the, the illuminations uh, department. Um, and it was before we actually allowed photos. We were only videos. We're now videos and photos. And um, I remember one of the professors we were talking with said, you know, gosh, we, we said, well, why don't we do a video of the photo? And you can talk about why they created this photo. And, and the professor was, gosh, you know, our students won't want to do this. This will never work. It's, it's just not going to be a good experience. And in the first week, like five students did it. And she's like, huh, kind of interesting. Another week, 20-some students did it. She's like, wow, they're really enjoying it. They're really liking it. Three weeks later, I think the whole class had done it. And they asked if we could open it up to the rest of the school because they wanted to feel connected to the rest of the school around things. And so it was a great maturation on how they did it. Um, and that was one example. They just wanted to highlight. Um, you know, and I know Andrew's going to talk on some other ones here. But we've had different departments use it different ways. Some are fan engagement with sports. Some are professors using it for final exams. I was in a restaurant um, picking up food one day, and, and this, um, someone that was helping me is like, hey, you know, we're talking. He's like, oh, I, went, I go to UCI, I play soccer. I'm like, I went to UCI, I play tennis. I give him my card, I'm like, let's grab lunch sometime. You know, I'd love to talk to you. And he's like, wow, you know, your, your company's Indy. He goes, I just did my final exam and uploaded it on Indy last week. And I had no idea, but professors were using it that way as well. And so there are a lot of different ways you can utilize the platform. Um, one is just to store content, one is to get engagement, one is to um, you know, bring awareness around what you're doing. And Andrew will talk. It's a great lead into exactly what he's going to ask or talk about. Yeah. So thank you. So my name's Andrew, and I'm going to talk to you about some examples that are already happening here on UCI's campus. And then we're going to actually walk through the nuts and bolts of how you set up an indie channel, um, and then how you set up the different use cases that are applicable for your different departments. So. First of all, I wanted to touch on um, the different options you have on your Indie channel, public versus private. Most of the stuff that we do on Indie is for public facing, meaning you're running challenges, forums or albums, and you're trying to create this content and then get that content out there into the community so that more people know about the great stuff that you're doing. The first um, piece of that is challenges. So as Neil touched upon earlier, um, we have a challenge um, challenge system whereby you can set up a challenge whether it's with students or whether it's with um, your customers or whether it's with faculty or anybody that you like to create a piece of content whether it's a photo or a video around a particular topic. Um, everybody then creates that content, they upload that piece of content to the challenge page and they're then encouraged to share that content out onto their own social media. As Neil mentioned, um, this is a great way to navigate around Facebook and Instagram's really limiting algorithms because if you share content from an individual perspective, you get much greater reach versus if you share content from a brand's perspective. And so we have something called Indie Buzz that is a measurement of how much engagement that piece of content receives across the internet. So the more likes, the more views, the more comments, the more shares, etc., the more your Indie Buzz score increases and the better um, you have the better chance you have of, of winning that indie buzz prize, and so it's a win from everybody's standpoint. It's a win from the you know the person holding the challenge because now they get this great content that gets shared in an organic way across across the internet, and it's also a win from the individual because then now they have a chance of of winning a cool prize. We also have a judges pick component, which is just given out to the person that does the best job um, in that challenge. So challenges is one key piece of it, and I'm, I'm going to go into some um, examples here in a few minutes. Real quick question on that. Uh, a lot of times I'll hear in conversation about students, um, the privacy issues around students. And there are, there are concerns where if we're going to make a video and we have a student in the background, like do we have to get their permission for it, right? So that's, that's a big struggle. How many people struggle with that when they're making videos? Okay, do you have to, do I need a consent form is all this. So what I'm hearing is that if, you know, if you have a contest situation where the students 
are uploading their own videos and they're clicking the terms and conditions and they're accepting that privacy that you guys have, you eliminate that issue of having to get approval of students being on video that's on your site, essentially. That's right. That's Not only that, you also get access to that content. So you, all this great UGC that's been submitted to your channel, you now have the rights to use that content for whatever you'd like, whether it's a social media campaign, a, an email campaign, or as Neil mentioned, if you want to actually embed that content onto your own website, you can do that. We have a really simple widget whereby you can just take that piece of content, put it onto the alumni you know, giving page, whatever it might be, um, and that's just you know, very cheap, organic, great content that you now have access to. So when they sign the terms and conditions, they're signing over the rights for you to use that video content how you see fit in any way, shape, or form with their permission along the way, which solves that issue that we have in the first place. That's right. And Greg like is it. an IP lawyer. And so if you have any questions at all, <laughs> I'm a former corporate lawyer, but I stopped that a long time. So far, he's dead on. <laughs> all right, good. Okay, good, good, good. Just we want to hear a burr if he does something. Like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's got a little electric buzzer. Okay, good. good. <laughs> Um, so, so that's the first piece of it, and again, I'll, I'll show you some examples of challenges that we've done here on campus. Um, the second piece of it is a forum. Again, two-way in nature. The difference between a forum and a challenge is that there are no prizes associated with a forum. So an example might be um, you're running a class, and at the end of the semester you want your students to submit a, um, an end of semester um, video you know, that shows everything that you've learned throughout the last um, 16 weeks. Um, they then have the opportunity to upload that content all into one branded, controlled page. Um, we call that a forum. Um, and then the last piece of it is albums. So an album is, like YouTube, a way to archive content, but unlike YouTube, you have a lot of control how you do that. So you can do it in a very branded, very controlled way. Um, and again, I'll show you some examples about um, how people are doing that here on campus. So that's the public, external facing um, piece of it. Um, we also have the internal piece of it. Um, so we don't have any examples right now of, of people using um, Indie for hiring on campus, but we do um, outside of campus. So the idea is that you know, traditionally, if you have a job rec, somebody submits a piece of paper, a resume to you, and you then have to evaluate that piece of paper and determine if that person's a good fit for this job. It's very limiting, right? You can't really tell you know, much from a piece of paper. Um, for consumer-facing or for, for customer-facing jobs, it's much better um, at least to screen that person if you can receive you know, a quick 60, 90 second video of that person so you can see you know, how they speak, how they present themselves. And so we have an opportunity where you can set up a hiring forum on your indie channel. You can ask people to maybe answer a couple of questions. You get a sense of how they speak, how they present themselves, whether they'd be a good fit for this role. If they are, then you bring them in for an in-person, and it's a really great way to, to screen that, that person. Um, it saves a lot of time on, on both sides of the equation. Well, question, for, question on that real quick. So if there was somebody, her name might be Sharon, and she's maybe leading the group at the OVPTL to come up with an entire, <laughs> just hypothetically, right? If they're trying to create an entire structure that systematizes the hiring for intern and student process, something like this could be robust enough to give access to different departments to use as a newer way of calling for uh, students who are interested in internships or positions and then those videos that are submitted would only be able to be seen by those people uh, it could be a public or private but I'm assuming it would be private yep. so it would almost act as a as a that first interview Absolutely. how many people have tried to set up interviews and and go through that whole process to hire students yes no how many love that process? <laughs> okay, so you can literally, you could, you could technically interview or see or have this face-to-face -face interaction with however many students you wanted without the scheduling or without the meeting in person and then kind of pick your pick from there and go. Yep. Okay, Absolutely. I like it. So hypothetically, Sharon, that might, you know. Might it's yeah, and so, so I'll just talk through one example of that. We don't have this in the deck, but um, we're working with a marketing agency here um, locally, uh, a sports marketing agency. Um, they have an internship program, kind of like what you just described, really, really popular. Thousands of kids every year want to become sports agents, want to become the next Jerry Maguire. So, you know, in the past, they've had literally tens of thousands of pieces of paper turn up via email or on people's desks. Now they ask those people to submit a, you know, a short video. It's just a really great way to determine, okay, would this person be a good fit in my culture? Would they be able to present themselves well? Can they speak well? And then you know, it's just a streamlined way of you know, bringing in 
um, those people to actually meet them in person. You don't waste their time, you don't waste your time. It just saves everyone a lot of time and money. Um, the next private example is, is around training. So um, again, we don't have anyone right now on the UCI campus using Indy for training, but um, you can use Indy for um, maybe an onboarding training or maybe a training around health and safety. Um, something where you want, again, want to control the content, um, control who sees that content. You can monitor who watches it, when they watch it, how many times they've watched it. Um, but it's a great way to deliver that content in a very secure fashion. Um, and then the last um, piece of it is internal communication. So, you know, if you wanted to communicate with your employees or communicate with your students, maybe sensitive information, again, you wanted to control who sees it, when they see it, how they see it, um, you can do that all on your Indie channel. Any, any questions on that? Does anybody right now have an onboarding process that is laborsome that, the, that you could see using video content to onboard a student or anything like that? Just, just curious. Okay. Um, okay, so, so as I mentioned, so an internal application is um, using Indie for um, communicating with professors and students. Um, one example that I, I mentioned earlier was an example, a management class here with Professor Matt Bailey. Um, he had all of his students at the end of the semester create a video. Um, it was a compilation of everything that they have learned over the last um, so many weeks um, during the semester. He then has them upload it to this forum. And the great thing for him is that now it's all in one centralized place and it's very organized. Um, prior to using Indie, he would use YouTube. But the problem with YouTube is that it's just scattered all over the place. And so it'd be very difficult to determine, you know, or for a new incoming student to be able to look at what happened last semester um, because it's just all over the place. And so now it's all on his own Indie channel. You can see, you know, 2017 versus 2018. Um, and you know it's all there in one place. Yes. So to kind of walk through the cumbersome mess of YouTube, the only way you'd be able to compile that is if either the students send you all the videos and you have to upload it yourself, mm -hmm. or with YouTube you'd have to somehow cobble it all together into a playlist. Yeah. But that's what we do. Yeah. Yeah. So with this, they're putting it into a concise bucket where you don't even have to do most of that administrative process because it's already baked into the platform, right? Exactly. exactly. That's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. How easy is it to sync um, a video or put a video, upload a video into like Instagram from your platform? So Instagram is a little bit unique because in order to upload onto Instagram, you have to have that piece of content on your phone bef bef before you can do it. Yeah, and that's that's yeah. So so we have instructions on how you can do that, but it is a little bit different iOS versus Android, and so there are, so there are some nuances to doing that. Um, but we have instructions, you know, it happens all, it's possible for sure. Um, and then we also have a hash, you know, if you wanted to run a challenge around Instagram in order for us to track Like an what, anteater cancer challenge? <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, so Anti-cancer so, challenge, I'm sorry. Can we have to stop cancer and anteaters? Yeah, 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 that too, both of them. <laughs> That's a new campaign. Um, but yeah, we have a way of tracking what happens again on Instagram so you can tell how much engagement this piece of content received on that particular platform. I have a question for this specific case use with the professor. Um, can you read the little the numbers that are there? I know people can't read it, but down the lower right hand corner next to the share. Yeah, so, so this is the buzz, the buzz score that um, this particular forum has accumulated. So and, and this- So like what is that number for example? So, as a so, that, so this particular forum has 19,638 buzz points. So that's a, a number that represents how many times each piece of content has been viewed, has been shared, has been watched, has been liked, has been retweeted, etc. cetera. Um, so that's our buzz algorithm um, that comes up with that number. So I'm assuming that M Professor Bailey is using this on a public platform so that the the videos are visible and then yep. students are taking and sharing their own stuff. Yep. So yep. question for everybody here, um, the idea of doing something and having it measurable, right? So if you run a campaign or run something like this, because we all have people that are above us that are looking down saying like, did that effort work or not? So this buzz score could be somewhat of a general matrix to say we did this and we had 19,000 XYZ. So there's an actual tangible measurement to it. That's right. And we also give you very detailed reporting 
um, by user and also by viewer as to what happened with that piece of content. So we can show you, okay, Ryan entered this particular challenge and then he shared it on this platform, this platform, this platform, and got this amount of engagement on each of these platforms, which is really key, crucial information because now I know, okay, Ryan's a great micro-influencer for me on Twitter. Before, you would never have been able to get that information. Okay, I saw another question when I was... Anybody else have another question? No? I also just wanted to expand on what Hai said earlier. Um, you know, YouTube is very limiting in terms of you know, collecting all that information, but it's also very limiting in the sense that when you do watch the content, um, you have no control over what happens. You have no control over the ads that are displayed around you. Um, you also have no control over what video pops up next. So if you're running um, you know, UCI Summer School um, and you're trying to collect content and you put that up on YouTube, you know, because of the YouTube algorithm, there's a pretty good chance that at the end of that video, um, a video from U, you know, UCLA summer school is going to come up. Um, you know, clearly, that's not what you want, um, especially in retail and other examples that we see um, in the world of commerce. You don't want to send a customer and then have that customer see a video from your competitor at the end of the video. It makes no sense. And so we're trying to control that, make it very branded and very controlled. So to get that buzz score, I would want to upload my video to Indie first and then share from there, correct? So that That's it's right. the most accurate? Yeah. 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 Um, um, how does it, uh, I guess, how do you aggregate the um, Instagram s score into that if, if it's kind of a convoluted process? Great question. So, and that's a good segue. Um, I do have a slide on that coming up. But when you share into Instagram, you get a particular hashtag that you have to include when you post. And that hashtag allows us to track what happens to it. So again, we can see the shares, the comments, the views um, on that particular platform. And that's, that's what we use to track it. So it's more detailed than like the Insight from Business account? Yes, much more, much more. So, um, and then not, not only that, but you also get all, all of their email information. Um, you know, again, if you were just working with Instagram or Twitter or um, any of the other platforms, you don't get any of that. Um, you know, you get um, reach, I believe, and, and a few others, and I also have a slide on that, but it's very limiting in terms so of... So you have, like, men and women, and, like, who, like, can, like, things like that, but not specifically how many times an individual can, or, like, if you use, like, I don't know, constant contact, like, email database, you can see how many times that person opened that email, which is kind of nice, because you can see their activity right. individually. Yep. So it's good that you got for that. Yes. Unless you download, like, a separate app, and, like, link it together. Yep. Yep. Okay. And the buzz score really aggregates sharing from all the platforms. So it kind of centralizes the, the volume that goes out there. Yep. And the challenge with students these days is some are on Twitter, some are on Instagram, some are on this, some are on that. And so this, like, it, it lobs it all up together in one big ball. Yep. Flame yep. ball. Absolutely. <coughs> um, okay, so I think we've talked to this. Um, so this is an example that um, Hi helps us with um, kindly. Um, so as Neil mentioned, we're located in the Cove. It's a great space just on the outskirts of campus here. Tons of great stuff going on at the Cove. Always got lunch and learns, business plan competitions, really smart people coming through and um, you know, presenting on really interesting stuff. Um, prior to um, Indy, well, actually, I'll ask you, how, how did you do it prior to, to working with us? So it was, a, it was a challenging process because we had a lot of public and private events. So that would need to be pre-vetted. And then all the content that was approved ended up looking on YouTube. But the challenge with YouTube is that categorizing them was a bit of a challenging process because there's so many different types of events that we had. So setting up the indie channel was pretty helpful because we could bracket it off into the main buckets that people typically attended our events for and typically asked to watch or view afterward. So rather than sending them to know five different YouTube videos or one playlist we could send them to our channel and they can kind of digest all of it at the same time. Yep. Um, and so you can see the uh, Cove's Buzz score for that channel overall is 29,854,390. So, million. so this is all the people who are who are viewing this content, all of the lunch and learns, all the business plan competitions, all the VC events. Um, after the event, they actually send out an email um, so that anybody who couldn't attend can now see a link to that particular video and are now able to consume all the great stuff that's going on at the Cove. So it's a great way, to Neil's point earlier, to magnify all of this really cool stuff that's going on at the Cove that otherwise people wouldn't know about. How many people here have programming, as in speakers or lunch and learns, 
or something that you have on a regular basis during the school year? Raise your hand. How many people? Okay, and then how many people are archiving it and sharing it and have it centralized? Okay, so how are you how are you doing that then? Is it through YouTube? It's through YouTube. Okay. <coughs> I was just curious. We're working on getting it actually all uploaded to Andy. Oh. So you get the extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think the idea is that you know you don't have to be the cove. You could be the writing center. And if you are having events going on or speakers or you know, <coughs> lunch with alumni, you could I'm assuming you could video it without it being super high production. And this gets back to the production aspect, right? You could probably set up a cell phone that's on a, not even a tripod, just hire a student to hold it or convince them to hold it. And like, but that, th there's this yep. organicness to it, right? Like you don't have to have a fully produced intro, outro. It, it can just be, that, that's what I think is unique about the, uh, the housing. We notes. find that that raw organic content actually gets consumed much better than something that's very polished. You know, people like real, they like authentic. Um, they don't want to see, you know, polished and, uh, you know, something that's overly produced. Um, so if you have a speaker that comes in, you could literally just videotape it on an actual cell phone and upload it to your indie channel and then it's archived and you can track to see who's actually watching it. Yep. And then at the end of the year, you can go see which speaker has the biggest buzz score and then know that that topic might resonate more and just whatever. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so this is the, the management class that I already spoke to. Um, we also did something, again, with the illuminations department um, around, it was a challenge called the OC Built Environment, where students had to go around Orange County and uh, make videos of kind of cool architecture that they liked. Um, this is the challenge that Neil spoke to earlier, the photo challenge. Can we read the buzz scores on this so we have so, somewhat of an idea? Yeah, hang on, let me... So this particular challenge received 375,000 buzz points, and um, the OC built challenge received 45,000 buzz points. Um, this, this one w was particularly cool. Um, this, again, was done by the UCI, UCI Illuminations um, Department. This was a cultural class um, where they asked um, their students, um, it was a Vietnamese cultural class where they asked their students to tell their family story about how they emigrated to the United States and got some really, really amazing content, really moving content about um, how these families moved um, across the world to the United States. Um, just, I'd recommend going and taking a look. Some really, really... The content was so good, the professor put it together, made a compilation and submitted a film overall from all the student entries <clears throat> into a couple independent film festivals. Yeah, again, all shot on cell phones, not highly produced, but just really raw, organic, really cool stories. Um, so that was a really, really cool use case. Um, and then the last one was something we did with the UCI Ath Athletics Department around March Madness last year. So they were trying to promote um, the Anteaters and they were trying to promote and sell tickets um, to the Big West Tournament. Um, that's held at the Honda Center. And so they did a challenge around um, basically Zot Pride. And so you had to submit a picture or a video showing why you're a great anteater. And so they got all this cool content. I think we have a couple of examples here. Um, yeah, of people showing, you know, why they're so proud to be, proud to be uh, part of, uh, of UCI. Um, so again, this, this leveraged our indie buzz algorithm. They were encouraging people to share this content out onto social media, and it just got people to know that you know UCI is playing in the end of season tournament here. You can go and buy tickets. Um, we actually added a watermark to all the content, so as it gets shared across social media, it's branded um, to the UCI athletics department. Um, a great way for them to, you know, get extra exposure for for something that they're already doing. Um, this is just a quick screenshot of what it looks like. When you hit that share button, um, these are the um, different options that you have. And if I was to click on Instagram or click onto Facebook or Twitter, you then get specific, uh, specific instructions of what to do on each of those platforms. So you know how to share it into YouTube, into <coughs> Instagram, into uh, Facebook or whatever it might be. Is that a Snapchat yellow? That's a Snapchat yellow, yep. Okay. Do you share each one at the time, or you can just press one button and it shares all of them? You have to share each one at a time because each platform is slightly unique. 
So, you know, as we talked about Instagram, you have to have that content on your phone before you can do it. Whereas Facebook, you can actually inject the content from Indie straight into Facebook. So each one is slightly different, and so for that reason, you have to do it one at a time. How many people here are on Snapchat? How many people think that the students are on Snapchat? <coughs> so one challenge is like, how do you get where the students are? And it doesn't seem to be normally an easy way to share to Snapchat, even if it's just saying, look, we're doing this platform, but you can share to Snapchat. It just connects the bond a little bit more between students and, and the, uh, the professional staff at school. Yeah, definitely. There's another question, I think. Oh, this, is, um, this is more of a question on those buzz points. So programmatically, if I was trying to approach it and use this platform to just see when students, like if I was to do like an AP series for academic probation, and there's more of a real talk, this is like this is what's happening, this is what you could use. Sure. And I wanted to get an update on when we had the most significant views, like what month during what quarter, and we can track those things to see when they were looking at them. Just, no, for sure, yeah, and maybe later on um, Anita is going to come up and we're going to actually run a real life example, but um, we can show you when we do that, you get a dashboard. Um, it's pretty similar to Google Analytics, but what you can do on that dashboard is filter by time. So you can filter by week or by month and then actually see the activity based upon that filter. So if you wanted to see users, um, average session duration, um, where the user has come from, things of that nature, you can Again, filter it down by a particular week um, so you can derive you know, what happened during that week that led to that increased traffic. One more. Yeah. On the sharing, so is it all social platforms or are, are people able to share it into, like, can we, I think you mentioned embedding, can we embed it into an email newsletter to share something that is already on Indie or? Yeah, I, 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 the, the Alumni Association uses it for their newsletter. So the one that Barney started off that now Jeff does, <clears throat> that's using our platform. So I think I have, yeah, here we are. Good segue. So the um, Alumni Association are using it for exactly what we just talked about. The great thing um, when you start uploading content is each piece of content has its own unique URL. So you can set the email up so that you know, there's a screenshot of that video or of that picture in the email. And when they click on that picture, it takes them directly to that piece of content on their indie channel so they can consume it. How many people have seen the, the newsletters, the, the alumni newsletters that they've been pushing out? Just curious. OK, yeah, you have. You've edited them. <laughs> can you customize the URL? Yes, you can. Yep. So um, again, we're going to walk through that um, with Anita. But yes, you can make your URL custom to your department. So indie.com forward slash UCI athletics or whatever's relevant to you. With the buzz points, can you see where you got the most traffic? Like, can you see we got the most buzz points from Facebook or we got the most yes. from Instagram? We can't. Okay. And you can actually filter it down by user too. So you can see not only where I got the most buzz points, but you can also see, okay, Ryan is really killing it on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And you know, he's getting this much engagement on Facebook versus Instagram versus all the, all the other platforms. But that would be a lie. I'd be on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. I don't that's like right. Facebook, but that's okay. So, I don't want to Too cool for Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, any more questions on? I think that's the end of my examples. Uh, actually, did you want to? Yeah, I think this is a great example. Michael Denon, being the early adopter that he is, he was excited about creating more exposure for this massive event on campus. And it is the Europe Symposium. If you haven't heard about it, it's literally like 1,200 students from all disciplines encouraged to do their own research where they've got their poster and they fill up the entire student center. It's just crazy impressive. There's just thousands of students that have all the research from the entire year. It's been going on for like 20 years. But when the event is done, the posters go into Aldrich Hall, and then when that's finished, the posters hopefully get recycled. But that's it. There's no long-lasting, long tail to it at all. So you have these students that have all of this crazy research all year long, but there's no long tail to it. And so he had this idea of creating a Europe challenge, and we did it on the Indie platform. So I'm going to show you what it actually looks like. By the way, just a reminder that I have this going on right now. Okay. So on the main channel, the Office of the Vice Provost, we have a description of it, and then these are the different platforms that we have. And then here's Michael Denon, and I'm not going to show the whole thing, but... Hi, I'm Michael Denon, Vice
Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning and Dean for the Division of Undergraduate Education here at UC Irvine. Think of this Europe Indie channel as a place where you can easily upload, engage, and share videos. Our goal is to have this be a place for Europe students and alumni to meet each other, connect, and share their research with the world. We will also be learn more about Europe or learn how to support the program. Go to europe.uci.edu. From one researcher to another, zot, zot, zot. <laughs> All right, nice little advancement play there at the same time, right? Right, I like that. So we have the description, and, and here are the videos. So this is kind of a cool platform. You actually just mouse over it. So what does this mean? Why should anyone care? Oh, I clicked on it. I'm Dan, an undergrad researcher here at UCI. And you might be wondering, what the heck this thing is? This is a Fowling community. How do I go back? A group of different species that include animals such as sea squirts and Okay, so again, um, if, you, if you look at this, these are all students, and we had a whole bunch of them that submitted. And what's crazy, what's really cool is that literally last year, there was no digital footprint of this. And this year, there's 182,000 views, essentially, on all these different platforms. And these students now can share this as a piece of their research because before it was just if you don't see me during the day, that's it. So this is a really exciting uh, success for us. And the idea is to continue this each year and then archive this. And what we, what we did to further include alumni, we had Europe alumni come in and review the videos for the judge's choice. So now you have alumni that are watching these videos that might not have otherwise made the physical event that could spark this conversation, that could land to a job, that could land to them being excited about research, to invest in the program, and so forth. So this is a great use case example of how we specifically uh, were using the Indie platform. Any questions on that? Yes? Are you aware of are there any like, restrictions um, for access to potentially in other countries on this? Neil or our IP lawyer? Uh, yeah, you know, we, we have uploads from, we get, we get from 200 countries. We, 200 countries <laughs> we can actually you know, change the language out as well on the textual uh, location. So um, I think we're, we haven't really had any problems with access or um, we have also Indies um, out in three different data centers in, in Amazon all over the world as well. So, um, you know, the usability for somebody in Southeast Asia should be the same sort of experience you have here in the United States. As far we're, not, as we're not blocked in China. We, you know, we, we verified that. <clears throat> and we have a team in India because we are working with retailers and such. As I mentioned, Indonesia and India and other countries as well. Yeah. <clears throat> you can also, one other thing is, Andrew touched on it briefly, is you can have any photo or video have a watermark on it. So to the extent you are working with a third party, um, like a company out in, in the community, you can get them to try to sponsor something. So every video would be associated with that brand, um, whether you're doing it for interviews for that company or you're just doing something like a research project for a company or something that they want to be associated with. It's a great way to charge them money to help sponsor and fund the, the, um, the research that may be going on. Because as these students share these videos around, it's giving them branding into their social media. So for example, I might approach Neil next year to sponsor the Europe Symposium. Hypothetically. <laughs> so All right. the watermark, can you, for example, it says UCI and Broadcom, for example, like mm -hmm. that would be together or <clears throat> just one or the other? We have one spot, um, so it depends. If you create a combined one, we can absolutely oh, do that. It's an, it's an image we can put on, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is you get pre-approval on everything if you want to. So in case you've got that rogue student who's putting up something that you don't want them to, Hypothetically, again, I wouldn't have ever done that when I was in school. Um, but you can also make sure that doesn't go live in public. So for the Europe challenge, each submission was able to, Saeed was able to watch it and say, I like this, this is a good representation of research. It didn't give away any um, information that was proprietary or anything that university would be scared about letting go out there in the public. So there is this ability to filter, but at the same time, you can open up that filter and you can sort of open up the floodgates for people in their submissions based on the content, you have a less chance of rogue students, hypothetically. Yes, sir. Um, I'll share an anecdote from when I was still at Probe is, so we have a, a startup incubator with a lot of early stage entrepreneurs and companies, and it's super intimidating to do a pitch at any point in your career, let alone when you're first starting out. 
So they actually recorded a lot of their own pitches and they uploaded it to a, an, an album within our indie channel. And that, uh, what they identified with me after the fact is they liked that format because on YouTube you can see a like, but you can also see a dislike. And you can also see sometimes people troll and for whatever reason they do that, you're not dealing with a lot of that when you look at the video. Uh, you just see the buzz score, that's more of a positive and inclusive experience rather than feeling that possible intimidation of the point that we've been already mentioning so far about it needs to be a certain threshold of quality. Um, it's, it's more encouraging. Yeah, when we launched, we purposely did not have thumbs down and we also don't have comments. <clears throat> if, you, if you don't like something, don't watch it. And so our, since our buzz score <laughs> takes into account engagement, I mean, you know, we work with lots of different brands in different ways. And so like Starbucks has donated close to a million dollars using the platform. Elite Modeling ran a model search, and we had girls that entered that had no arms, had muscular dystrophy, had been burned, things that you know they may not have gone and walked down the street, but to, to a modeling agency to do this, but there was no negativity on anything. We have you know, the Denver Bronco, different brands use it different ways, but one thing that we thought was constant was there should be no negativity, and if you just don't like it, don't watch it. That's not a hypothetical. No. <laughs> Can they upload documents, not just video, but documents and photos, or is it just? Um, you know, we will do that in um, a special use case. Um, okay. What we what we've allowed for is the downloading of that type of stuff. So you can download like music files and PDFs when you're the student or the, the person engaging. Okay. Um, uploading something non-standard, mm -hmm. not not a picture or video is, is something we'd have to do on okay. as a case-by-case -case basis. For, for example, if they want, if we wanted to get, it'd be great to have video, but we also want some written file from them, that, that's not possible yet, no. Yeah, not. Well, when you, when you submit the video, you have a description of the video, okay. and you could drop it in the description, maybe. Okay. Yeah, there's certain ways to get around it, so it just depends on what it is, so that's why we say case-by-case -case to see you know, how easy it is to do that. We have defaulted in it attachment with a survey monkey as an example, so you can ask extra questions and get extra things from that, but not a, <clears throat> not a full research paper. Okay. All right, great discussion. I'm gonna show some other examples of what we're planning to do, and the reason for these examples is how can we mirror that, copycat it, because again, it's just about sharing best practices. So we have the campus-wide honors page that we're, that we're looking to do. And the campus-wide honors is the top 3% of all incoming students. And they have a nice little group where they have special curriculum and they, a lot of team building and leadership. And these are hopefully the, the top level students that employers out there are really trying to find on campus. And so the idea for this that Michael Dennett has a vision of is allowing them to go on there and actually pitch themselves. This is what I'm passionate about. This is what I love to do. And this is, you know, the career path that I want. And then having that as a portal for employers that Advancement is working with or saying, look at these amazing students. Here's specifically the campus wide honors and having an opportunity for it to be a showcase of the campus wide honors program. And so that's kind of unique use case there. Then with first generation, uh, as hopefully everybody knows that we're big on first generation here and, and UCI is nationally and internationally known for it. So we want to capture these stories and we want people to share their own first gen experiences. And we've asked to do that through the first gen faculty challenge and now it's adopted by all 10 UC schools. But this is a way for us to have a more localized on campus people feeling comfortable to share those stories and there can be a lot of positivity behind it. So those are the three that have to do with academic, and then one is for staff development. And Michael Denon has uh, shot out. So when you go to the big event, you know, everybody can get a little card and you write, hey, I'm really excited with Joy because she did a lot of great website work for me. I just want to give her a shout out. Then that gets inner office mailed to you and then you get it and you're like, yay, and then you put up on your cubicle and you're like, here we go. That's a very analog process. So the idea is with these Zot moments, when you see something, say something, but not like TSA style. To the, the other way, right? <laughs> so when you see something that's like Zot moment and really incorporates the values and, and the, the principles that we stand behind as the Office of Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning, which we have in all of our different departments so everybody sees it, it's a matter of going, well, quick, I'm gonna do a quick selfie video. Hey, it's Ryan here and you know, Neil's done a really cool job here, wouldn't he? And he's like, what, what, what <laughs> whatever it is, it's just a very organic video. Or you see something and later on you're like, hey, I just really wanna give a shout out to this person. They I saw him working with a student, I saw him just, the student came back and it was just life changing. And that's internal for the staff really. So it's not, it's not something, that we're, we're planning on making it public, but it's really just for this replacing the digital writing on a card. Uh, so that's another example that he's excited about as well. 
So those are just OVPTL uses, and I just want to encourage you to think of how you could apply and how you could use this. All right, I'll hand it back to the man here. So this is something that we touched on earlier. Um, what you're currently getting on social media, not very much. Likes, views, comments, number of followers, um, versus what you can get um, when you use the Indie platform. Um, so it's really a way to you know, take control of your customer um, or your student or whatever it might be that you're, that you're trying to work with um, and, and get back all this data that you can use for future activities. We, we don't track buzz from LinkedIn. Oh, buzz. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> We're currently linked out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we do want to add LinkedIn, so it is on the web app. And so, you know, again, why is this important? So you get ownership um, of all this data. So everything from emails to, you know, where your people are spending their time, how they're spending their time, how they're engaging with this content. Um, and everything else that goes with that data. <clears throat> All right, so let's show a quick start <clears throat> demo to how this actually works from the back end. Yeah, so this is Anita. Um, Anita graduated from UCI in 2015. Um, yeah. Chemical engineering All right, big round of applause for Anita. <laughs> <laughs> alumni, hiring alumni, Anita yes. Anita is our rock star. And so for the last few minutes, we wanted just to walk you through actually setting up a channel. Um, it's super simple. India is a templated platform. So um, it's very much plug and play. It's super simple. You can't break anything. And we just wanted to show you um, just for a few minutes how that actually works. So OK, so we're on Indie.com. And we're just going to show you um, how you're going to sign up for a new account, um, clicking on the, the link there on the top right hand side. Just while Anita walks through this, I'm just going to tell you that the, the goal is to make your Indie channel as branded um, as possible. So we want to make the transition from your own website to your indie channel as seamless as possible. Um, that is if you're not actually embedding the content into your own channel. And so we make a big effort to brand your indie channel um, so that it's very consistent with your actual website. And so you'll notice once we get going here, there's very little indie branding um, at all. And, and that's by design. Um, it's designed to um, reflect your own brand and once you're there, you, you're going to stay there, unlike YouTube. OK. All right, so once you've created your account, to start managing your account, you're going to click on the Manage icon there on the top right-hand side. Once you click on this link, it takes you into the back end where you can then manage everything associated um, with your channel. Um, so Nita's going to click on the Manage icon there and then click on to Channel just to start off with. and. From this point, she has the option. You're pressing too hard. Just a single click. <laughs> Don't worry. I've been having issues with this as well. <laughs> so at this point, you now have the option to, to brand your indie channel. So if you want to add a banner, you can do that. A thumbnail image, you can do that too. A little bio to what your department's all about. Um, you also have the opportunity to add a little intro video, um, just like Michael Denon did. Um, Again, we hope very, very simple to use, very plug and play. It's just a matter of just clicking on the appropriate tab, uploading the content. We accept any video file, any photo file, JPEG, PNG, doesn't matter. Um, just find the content, hit upload. Um, it takes a couple of minutes usually to reflect onto the front end, but um, that's it. Su super simple. Um, and you know, like Neil said, if you run into any issues along the way, we're always here to help. Melissa. Good question. So um, if we go and click on the tag button here, um, <clears throat> we can then customize this URL. So that's indie.com forward slash Ryan's Lunch and Learn, you know, or, or, or whatever you want it to be. So to the extent that that URL is available, you can then create that vanity URL, and then that URL is unique to you, and, and, and you own it um, and to do whatever you like with it. Does that? Does it seem straightforward? Any, any, any questions around, around the back end? Once you get up and running and people start interacting with your indie channel, you can click onto the dashboard. Um, that's where you're going to see all of that great data around how people are using your indie channel. 
So you're going to get information like how long are they spending on your indie channel? What are they looking at? Where are they coming from? You can dive down into kind of what devices they're using to access your indie channel, all kinds of um, kind of cool information. Obviously, it's empty right now. Question? So I know you covered, like, let's say, hypothetically, the School of Social Ecology decided to get the indie and they broke it down based on like CLS, P PSV, and all of our departments. Yes. When we log in, would we have to use a central login, and then we would have different channels within that that we would control, or would each department have their own login that they can use under that one account? Yeah, so a couple of different ways you could do that. So you could have, like um, Ryan's example of the OVBTL, you could have a master channel and sub-channels underneath that. Um, that would probably make the most sense. Um, and then in that case, you'd have uh, a kind of a master login and then also individual logins for each of the channels underneath that master login. So that you, know, you in the school of you know, whatever it might be, have the ability to log in, make changes, um, but you don't have the ability to log in perhaps to another channel or within that um, one master channel. A good question. Okay, so now we're just gonna click onto challenges. So if Anita goes back to the manage, GearCog and clicks onto Challenges. You'll see she has the option of hitting Create New. That pops open the wizard. And then at this point, you can follow the steps and um, set up your example challenge. Um, you know, really, you, know, you can't go wrong. It prompts you um, along the process all the way. Um, the hashtag here actually corresponds to the URL for this particular challenge. Um, and you'll see once she sets up the date, um, you then, on the next screen, have the option to add a little description, add your prizes. Um, you can do things like customize your email templates. It's, it's a very flexible, there are a lot of different options, but um, again, we, we hope very easy, very simple, and very quick to use. So you can literally set these things up in you know, five minutes or less. So she's just grabbing a banner. Does that make sense? Great. Anything else we need to go through? Yeah, question. On the contest and like challenges side, what separates you guys from like short stack? Short stack. I'm not familiar with short stack. What are they? They primarily like are they integrate with the social platforms to do contests where users can go in there, interact with your website and stuff. I know you guys have like a more of like a embedded feature where you host all the videos on the website. Yep. The short stack can interact with like constant contact, all those like web services to basically promote your contest going out and collect all that data in a similar way that you guys do. Gotcha. Yeah, the, there are different solutions out there that do pieces of, of, of what you can do on Indie. Um, but at least to date, we haven't found anything that is as encompassing as um, you know, what you can do on your Indie channel when it comes to embedding the content onto your own website, running challenges, um, you know, archiving content, engaging with um, customers or stakeholders like you can on, on your Indie platform. So um, I'll take a look at short stack. Yeah, I'll, but I'll touch on it just for a second. So the big difference from doing kind of the traditional challenges using someone like a short stack or others that use really hashtags to do it, and that's the traditional way every brand today does contests, is they use a hashtag-based contest. Um, lots of different things. One, you actually get to pre-approve the content before it goes live, or is it, you can put anything to any hashtag and you can't control what's up there against your hashtag. So you get that approval rights. Two, you actually own the content. <clears throat> so again, a big part of our thing is we are getting you content, which at the end of the day, we think is really important for every brand. Frankly, not just the university, it, every brand today, that's our, our proposition, is you shouldn't let social media basically own your content, own your data, own your customer, and own the engagement. And so we are basically giving you that ability back. Um, <clears throat> so you get the content, you get to pre-approve the content. You then, because of the, the buzz aspect of it, folks are incentivized to share that content. And not just on that one platform where you're running that hashtag-based challenge, but on multiple platforms, because as Ryan mentioned, he may be on Twitter, and someone else may be on Facebook or Snap, and you still want to get that across, but if you run a, a hashtag-based challenge, you're generally running it on one platform. Um, so, you, so really, it gives you the content, the data, um, and, and the incentive to share it, uh, and the controls, compared to someone that'll just say, hey, you know, run a hashtag-based contest. 
Yeah. Is there some um, component of like gamifying this in a way for the buzz feed? I mean, the buzz points. Um, so on your your channel, do you have like a stats of like who's doing well? Yeah, there's a leaderboard. So yeah, yeah. And that's how like when Starbucks gave away the million dollars or, or thereabouts, it was looking at like they, they basically said whoever drives the most buzz, they were going to pick from that. And so <clears throat> as Andrew touched on, we have two different ways to give out prizes. I mean, you can come up with others, but the two standard ones are ones that judges pick. That means you pick the photo or video that you like the most, irrespective of if that person got views, engagement, or any kind of buzz. The second is who's driving the most buzz because there's a lot of value in getting your brand out there. And, um, and so we have a leaderboard. You can, tr you can um, sort based on the most recent or mo most buzz. And so folks are always looking at how they're doing, especially like we have one right now, a Pro Bowl um, cornerback for the San Diego Chargers is giving out tickets to a game to see who's the, the biggest fan. And, and then second, or first, second, third place buzz is getting uh, merchandise, signed merchandise from them. So people are always looking and trying to push their buzz score up by getting more people to watch that content, like that content, share that content. All right, clap for that content, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>